causes of World War II were the acts of aggression committed by Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, and Imperial Japan during the 1930s. These three nations, known as the Axis powers, were intent on increasing their areas of political and economic control. The Rome-Berlin-Tokyo Axis wanted to control the world. The territorial aggressions of the Axis powers demonstrated the inability of the League of Nations to maintain peace. The failure of the League was a failure to adopt a united front against aggression, the failure to employ a policy of collective security. Instead, appeasement and indecision on the part of the democracies encouraged Axis aggression and resulted in Germany's attack on Poland on September 1st, 1939. The invasion of Poland marked the beginning of World War II and the end of appeasement, the policy of sacrificing innocent countries to an aggressor. Britain and France now declared war on Germany, and the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain told the world, We in France are today going to the aid of Poland, for it is evil things that we shall be fighting against. Brute force, bad faith, injustice, oppression, and persecution. The totalitarian states of Italy, Germany, and Japan had their roots in the economic misery that came in the aftermath of World War I. Inflation and financial difficulties were followed by social disorder and political conflict. Rabble-rousing leaders took advantage of the widespread unrest and dissatisfaction. In this atmosphere of despair and discontent, many people gave their support to political groups that promised prosperity at the price of personal liberty. The result was totalitarianism, a form of government based on the supremacy of the state over the individual and marked by one-party rule under a strong leader or dictator. In Italy, in 1922, the fascist party marched on Rome and seized the government. Under the dictatorship of Benito Mussolini, the fascists set up a totalitarian state. In Germany, in 1933, Adolf Hitler and his Nazis captured the allegiance of the German people. The Nazi party established a totalitarian regime based on the myth of German racial superiority. In Japan, the militarists and industrialists controlled a semi-feudal government. The Japanese believed their emperor was the son of heaven and that they were a divine nation whose imperial destiny was to rule all of Asia. Japanese demands for expansion were matched by Italian shouts for control of the Mediterranean. And the Nazis ranted about Lebensraum, living space. But no matter what they called it, it meant territorial aggression. Military training encouraged feelings of extreme nationalism among the youth of all three countries. Children were taught to give complete allegiance to the state and blind obedience to its leaders. The totalitarian state made aggressive war an accepted instrument of national policy. War is to the male what childbearing is to the female, proclaimed Mussolini. And Hitler shouted, for the good of the German people, we must wish for a war every 15 or 20 years. As the Axis powers built up their military strength, the democracies looked on complacently and indifferently. It was Japan who committed the first act of aggression leading to World War II. Its invasion of Manchuria in 1931 started the world on the road to war. The League of Nations was shocked by the Japanese attack and appointed a commission headed by Lord Lytton to investigate. The commission as a whole will move to Nanking and from there make our way via Peking 
Mr. Manchuria, carry out the investigation which has been entrusted to us by the League of Nations. The Lytton Commission eventually condemned Japan as an aggressor, but the League proved powerless to halt the rapid conquest of Manchuria. As a result of the Lytton Report, the Tokyo government withdrew from the League of Nations. Ethiopia was the scene of the next major setback to the cause of collective security. This small African country, with its valuable mineral resources, had long been a target of Italian territorial ambition. In October 1935, Italian forces invaded the defenseless territory. Once again, there was worldwide outrage at the attack, but no effective action to stop the aggressor. At the League of Nations, the Ethiopian emperor, Haile Selassie, made a moving and prophetic speech. He declared, it is my duty to inform the governments assembled in Geneva of the deadly peril which threatens them. It is international morality that is at stake. God and history will remember your judgment. This time, the League of Nations voted economic sanctions against the aggressor, but failed to include the crucial item of oil. Italy's conquest of Ethiopia was the second act of aggression leading to World War II. In Germany, Hitler and his Nazis showed their contempt for international agreements by repudiating all treaty limitations on armament and re-establishing universal military service. Earlier, they had withdrawn from the League of Nations. In March 1936, Nazi Germany sent troops into the Rhineland in violation of treaties declaring the area a demilitarized zone. Germany's occupation of the Rhineland was really a tremendous bluff at the expense of the Western powers. Hitler's troops were given an enthusiastic welcome, but had been issued separate orders commanding them to retire if French forces had made any move to stop them. A German field marshal later testified the French could have shoved us out like that. Once again, totalitarian defiance had moved the world closer to war. The Spanish Civil War was the next step on the road to catastrophe. It began in July 1936 as an attempt by the army to overthrow the Spanish Republic. The rebels had the support of the monarchist, conservative, clerical, and fascist parties. Under command of General Franco, they received aid from Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. The government forces were supported by Soviet Russia as well as by communist and non-communist sympathizers from all over the world. After the defeat of the Republic, Spain became a fascist dictatorship, and Franco went on to ally himself with Mussolini and Hitler. For Germany and Italy, the fascist victory was a great triumph. Their victorious troops came home from Spain to be welcomed by the praises of the generals and the plaudits of the populace. For Britain and France, the fall of the Spanish Republic was a grave setback. But the real losers in the three-year-long bloodbath were the Spanish people. While civil war had been raging in Spain, Japan was following her way of imperial destiny in Asia. In 1937, she invaded China on a large scale. Though the Chinese fought back fiercely, the leading cities of the country were soon overrun by the Japanese attack. Despite protest notes from Washington and London, Tokyo knew that neither the United States nor England would go to war over China. Japan's plan to rule Asia was not to be halted, at least not yet. In Europe, Hitler was advancing the German plan of conquest and subjugation. In March 1938, 
Austria lost its independence. Amidst the cheers of Austrian Nazis, German troops occupied the country. For the many Nazi sympathizers throughout Austria, it was an occasion to celebrate. For those who did not welcome Hitler's armies, it was the climax to five years of Nazi intimidation, falsehood, terror, and assassination. Overnight, Hitler had added more than six and one-half million citizens to the Third Reich. Again, there was no serious opposition from the democracy. Though the British and French government continued to appease Hitler, public opinion in the West was divided. Many felt the time to stop further aggression was now, before it erupted into a world war. At the League of Nations, the Soviet Union had repeatedly called for collective action against Germany. But the democracies distrusted Russia more than they feared Germany. France was confident that its Maginot Line fortification would prevent any German invasion of French territory. British spokesmen claimed that the annexation of Austria could only have been stopped by force, and Britain was not prepared for war. Across the Atlantic, the United States was officially committed to neutrality. After the annexation of Austria, Hitler proclaimed that he had no more territorial ambitions in Europe, but captured German documents. State that on May 30th, 1938, Hitler declared to his generals, it is my unalterable will to smash Czechoslovakia by military action in the near future. During the summer of 1938, the Nazi press attacked Czechoslovakia. It denounced the supposed mistreatment of the German-speaking minority living in the Sudetenland, the area bordering on Germany. And Britain, with the consent of France, urged Czechoslovakia to make concessions to Hitler. But these were not enough to satisfy the German dictator. By mid-September, Europe was again threatened with a major crisis. Hitler was demanding the Sudetenland. In Czechoslovakia, President Benish proclaimed martial law. We hope that we shall have the possibility to continue our work also in the future believing that international peace can be safe and honestly maintained by pacific means. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain now traveled to Germany to meet with Adolf Hitler, the first of three trips to appease the Nazi dictator. At their meeting, Hitler informed Chamberlain that the Sudetenland must be made a part of the Third Reich immediately, or there would be war. When Britain and France insisted that Czechoslovakia comply with the German demand, the Czech cabinet yielded under pressure. Chamberlain flew back to Hitler to inform him of the Czech capitulation. Once again, the German dictator presented the British Prime Minister with a series of new demands, even more severe, and an ultimatum. Unless the German terms were met by October 1st, the German army would march. This time, Prague rejected Hitler's demand. War seemed inevitable. All of Europe began to mobilize. But at the 11th hour, frantic diplomatic efforts resulted in a decision to hold a conference at Munich. Chamberlain eagerly accepted the call to Munich. My policy has always been to try to ensure peace. For the third time, the British Prime Minister flew to Germany. As the question of war or peace hung in the balance, Hitler, Mussolini, Chamberlain, and Deladier, the French Prime Minister, arrived in Munich to decide the fate of Czechoslovakia. No Czech representatives were invited. The United States, while appealing for peace, announced it had no obligations in the conduct of the present negotiations. Desperate to preserve peace at any price, Chamberlain and Deladier accepted all of Hitler's terms and signed the Munich Pact. With a stroke of the pen, Hitler acquired one-third of 
of all Czech territories. But if Britain and France, along with the Soviet Union, had stood up to Hitler, he might have been stopped and World War II prevented. Instead, Chamberlain returned home to wave the Munich pass, temporarily a hero. Mr. Chamberlain says that he believes it is peace for our time as he looks round on the crowd of us standing here below. And in France, the Laudier described Hitler as a man with whom one can make politics. And what of Adolf Hitler, this man with whom one could make politics? and his promise to respect the now defenseless borders of Czechoslovakia. In less than six months, his armies occupied the remainder of the country. As German tanks rolled into Prague, another independent nation ceased to exist. Peace with honor was a myth. As the relentless drift of war continued, Britain and France finally realized they could no longer appease Hitler. But now Russia, long rebuffed by the West, signed a non-aggression treaty with Germany. The Nazi-Soviet Pact of August 1939 permitted Germany to invade Poland without fear of a two-front war. It gave Russia time to prepare for the eventual Nazi attack on the Soviet Union. For the world at large, it made it clear that time had run out. Britain and France now stood alone against the totalitarian aggressors. The stage was set for World War II. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. It was the start of six years of warfare. In less than a year, Hitler was master of the European continent. Italy entered the war as France fell, and for another year, Britain fought on alone until June. 1941, when Germany suddenly turned on the Soviet Union. Six months later, Japan attacked the United States, and World War II became a total global war. In this worldwide struggle for survival against totalitarian aggression, the coalition of the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union formed the basis for the United Nations. While the war's ultimate causes involve many questions of judgment and interpretation, the record of active aggression from Manchuria to Poland is clear-cut. So is the failure of appeasement and the ineffectiveness of the League of Nations' efforts to adopt a firm policy of collective security. And about the immediate events leading to World War II, there can be little debate. They stem directly from the actions of one man and one country, Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany. And there came a time when there was no longer any alternative but to stop Hitlerism by force.